together in prayer as we come before the throne of grace together. Let's pray. Indeed, Lord God, at all times we praise your name, for you alone are the one worthy of such, that you are the one to whom we raise our voices in praise and in worship, that you are the one on whom we call when we come to an end of ourselves, that you are the one who we rely upon for life and for salvation, that you are God and that you are good, that you are the sovereign one, that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. And so, together as we gather this morning to pray and to praise, to worship and to wait upon you as our Lord and our God, we pray that you would reveal yourself to us, that by your Spirit you would move amongst us, that by your Word that you would uh, enliven our hearts and that we would leave this place rejoicing in the Lord Jesus Christ as new creations in Him, the old having gone, the new having come. Lord God, we give thanks for the gift of the Holy Spirit who makes us dwelling within the hearts of those who follow You, who trust You, who believe in Your name, and who seek to live according to Your instruction, Your Word, and Your will. And so, Lord, we pray that You would lead us and guide us in that, and that we would be effective witnesses for You here in the world that You would speak through us, that You would use us in the work of our hands, in the thoughts of our minds, uh, to be uh, great heralds of the gospel, ambassadors for Christ here in the places where You have placed us. Forgive us for our pride and self-righteousness. Forgive us for the waywardness of our own hearts and the rebellious nature that we possess. Lord God, break within us any sense of haughtiness or pride. 
Give us a meekness and a humility. Give us a desire uh, to serve and not to be served. Give us the desire to be those who engage rather than merely spectate. May we be those who uh, indeed ourselves to others through our willingness uh, to do all things, that we wouldn't merely stand on the sidelines and pick, pick holes and point out problems, but that we would be the problem solvers, that we would be those who would be willing to take up our cross daily and follow you, that we would be willing to deny ourselves in order that we may be effective in your name. This morning, we remember those who are uh, at a low ebb in life, those who are struggling with different things within their own experiences, those who are weak in body, those fragile in mind, those who are faced with difficult providence, those who are uh, hospitalized, those who are in periods of recovery or treatment. Lord God, You know them. You know each and every one, and we pray uh, for those associated with the congregation here even, that You would be close to them. We remember those who grieve and those who mourn. Uh, we think uh, particularly of the Burgoyne family as they uh, look to a funeral in Stirling tomorrow of uh, the late Jamie. Uh, Lord, we pray that You would be with them in the difficulty and the hardship and in the soreness of such a providence, uh, and that uh, You would be close to them in their grief, that they would know the comfort and the strength, the compassion of Your everlasting arms around and underneath, sustaining and keeping as only You can. We remember also the Belshaw family, and we remember the families affected in Sky and Loch Alsh through uh, these acts that were carried out uh, last week. And so, Lord, we pray that You would bless us, bless this out of worship. May it be pleasing in Your sight, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The rest of us are going to open our Bibles this morning to John's Gospel and chapter 3, perhaps the best-known chapter in all of Scripture, could it be, or certainly containing some of the best-known verses, certainly, in the world. Uh, John's Gospel and chapter 3, but we're going to pick up the reading just at the end of chapter 2 to just give ourselves a wee bit of uh, context. John and chapter 2 and verse 23, and uh, we'll read uh, these verses. This is God's Word. Now, while he, while Jesus, was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in Him. Amen. May the Lord bless that reading of His own Word. Shall we unite our hearts together again and pray? Lord, we thank You this morning as we gather in Your presence to read Your Word, that it is so illuminating to our minds and that there is such depth and so many 
the riches, indeed the unsearchable riches of Christ are found within your word living and active. That word that speaks into the reality of our lives, that word that is relevant even in its age, that word that is unchanging, that is infallible, that is inerrant, that it is your own holy and inspired word. And we give thanks today that as we turn to it that we find uh, timeless truth, we find eternally good instruction, we find your word that teaches us what it means to live and how we might live in light of the joy of the gospel and the wonder of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for that gospel. We thank you for that great hope. We thank you for that eternal security that is offered to us freely by the grace of God in your mercy and by your love. And yet, Lord, we look around and we see so many people who are lost, so many people who are uh, outside your kingdom, so many people who have little or no interest in the things of God. And yet, at the same time, we are faced with the fragility of life, the brevity of life, the uncertain nature of life. We have seen in the past number of days, even locally, how uncertain things are and how things beyond our wildest imagination can come to pass with no warning, that life as we know it can be snuffed out so readily that in the blink of an eye, things can change. And so, Lord, we pray that you would speak into the individual hearts and lives of people that they may consider their own mortality, their own brevity of life before you, and consider what it means to truly be an eternal soul. We know that we have been created in your image and in your likeness, we know that we have a soul which is transcendent of the world in which we live. It goes beyond the mere temporal and earthly. We know that we have a soul that surpasses the, the human frame that we inhabit for such a short time. And so, Lord, as we recognize these, thing, these things, we pray that we would take time to consider our own standing before you as the creator and the sustainer of all. For we recognize, Lord God, that without you that there is nothing. For how might things hold together? How may life thrive and be sustained on this planet in such a vast cosmos? We recognize that it is because of the architecture of your hand, the gracious and compassionate touch that you have for a people made in your likeness and your image. Lord, we recognize that it takes far more faith to believe in nothing than it takes to believe in you, the life giver, the creator, the designer, the sustainer. And so, Lord, we pray today that as we open your word that we would meet you perhaps for the first time, that we would see you and that we would come to you and that you would indeed make us new, that you would make us reborn, regenerated, that we would join the redeemed ranks of the church of Christ, the visible body in the world, and that we would be transformed in our nature from mere human beings, mere creation of God, to become the children of God. We recognize that not everyone is your child yet, but that you desire that none would perish, and that is why we're still here. And so, Lord, we pray that we would point one another to Jesus to the gracious and to the loving God, and that we would become children of God in and through Christ Jesus, our Redeemer, our Savior, the Messiah. And so, Lord, we pray today that as we worship, that we truly would know Jesus, that we truly would follow Him, that we wouldn't be mere um, religionists, that we wouldn't be mere traditionalists, that we wouldn't merely follow routine, but that in coming here we would do so in spirit and in truth, seeking you, knowing you, and being transformed by you through your word and by your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we turn back to John chapter 3 for a short time this morning, again, we're just going to sing from the Sing Psalms in Psalm 130. Lord, from the depths I call to you, Lord, hear me from on high and give attention to my voice when I for mercy cry. We'll stand and we'll sing to God's praise.
with me then this morning to John and chapter 3 as we consider that with the Lord's help for a few moments. I wonder if I was to go around the room with a, a roving mic and ask the question this morning, are you happy with your life? Are you content with your lot? Are you pleased with the way that things are going or have gone in your life? Or do you find yourself daydreaming, perhaps, about, I wonder what it would be like to start over, a clean slate, a fresh start? Well, that's where we are today in John chapter 3, as Nicodemus comes and has this encounter with Jesus, this conversation that, 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 that brings us to the real beating heart of the Christian faith and what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And as we come and we see this interaction that there is between Nicodemus and Jesus, there are a number of things that I think that we can draw from that, five of them if I'm being uh, precise. And they all begin with C for ease of remembering. Credentials, curiosity, condition, cure, and change. Credentials, who Nicodemus was. Curiosity, the spiritual curiosity that drove him to come and meet with Jesus. The condition, Nicodemus's spiritual condition. Uh, The cure, the antidote to the critical condition which he found himself, and the change which an encounter with Jesus brings. So, briefly, let's look at these five things this morning. Firstly, then, credentials. Verses 1 and 2 give us the credentials that Nicodemus comes to Jesus with. with. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi or teacher, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs that you're doing if God were not with him. If we wanted a brief, rounded picture of who Nicodemus was, or how we might describe Nicodemus, let me give you three R's. He was religious, he was rich, and he was a ruler. We could add another one, respected probably as well, but let me not start adding notes to the notes that I already uh, have. Nicodemus uh, is a Greek name, though he was a Jewish man. Uh, That wasn't all that uncommon, but his name uh, means ruler or victor over the people, one who rules over 
the people. The Talmud uh, tells us that Nicodemus was one of the four richest men in the city of Jerusalem. He was a wealthy man later on. We know that he, he pays for the myrrh and the aloes to anoint uh, the, the body of Jesus in the tomb. He's a wealthy man, but not only is he a wealthy man, he's also a Pharisee. History tells us that later on, Nicodemus, Nicodemus's son, uh, will negotiate with the Romans uh, in, in terms of the Jewish surrender in, in 70 AD before the fall of Jerusalem. That's just a, a wee aside. But the point was, he was a, an influential, uh, significant, well-known, famous man. But he was also a Pharisee. What's a Pharisee, you might be asking? Well, a Pharisee is a member of this ultra-Orthodox group of Jewish people, usually teachers and rulers. There was only about 6,000 of them at the time of Christ. Very strict, very legalistic, very narrow about keeping the law. That was their ultimate goal. That was their motivation in life, was to keep the law. Now, when we hear the term law, we think of the first five books of the Bible. That's generally what the law is referred to, the Torah. But to the Pharisee, they had added more and more and more regulations, extra biblical standards, if you will, called the oral law. So, an example uh, would be the Sabbath. In the Old Testament, there is only three paragraphs that talk about the Sabbath day, the laws for the Sabbath, Sabbath day. They're Saturday, and what you would do on that day, and what you wouldn't do on that day. Only three paragraphs, a very a snapshot view. Not much is said. But then there's something called the Mishnah uh, that was added, and it was this organized, codified, scribal law made up by the scribes and the Pharisees, and 24 chapters of the Mishnah are devoted to laws about the Sabbath. Sound familiar? Well, yeah, we've added things, have we not? In our own tradition, and our own Presbyterian history, there has been traditions added to the biblical standard or warrant. Now, there was something called the Talmud, and these were rabbinical uh, commentaries uh, on the Mishnah, uh, and the longest of the, the two Talmuds was the Babylonian Talmud, and there was 156 double pages of regulations about the Sabbath. So, it wasn't enough for the Pharisees to simply say, don't work on the Sabbath, don't carry a burden on the Sabbath. They wanted to specify chapter and verse right down into the minutia, the nitty-gritty of what that meant, of how they should, should take that. Don't carry a burden on the Sabbath, it said. But then somebody else would say, well, what's a burden? And what does it mean to carry the burden? And the, the rabbis would say, and I quote, food in equal weight to a dried fig, enough wine for mixing in a goblet, enough milk for one swallow, enough honey to put on a wound, enough oil to anoint a small member, enough water to moisten an eye salve, enough paper to write a customs house notice upon, or enough ink to write two letters of the alphabet. That's what they determined carrying a burden was. And if you did any of those things, then you were bearing a burden and therefore breaking the Sabbath. And it led to endless, you can imagine, debate, discussion, arguments about these things. Can you lift a lamp on the Sabbath? Is that a burden? Is that work, lifting up your lamp? Could you carry a child? What about your child? Could you carry a child? Is that a burden? Is that work? Is that then breaking the Sabbath? Could you wear your false teeth on the Sabbath? Would that be would that be wearing a burden? They're, they've written all of, about this stuff. There's even a whole discussion uh, in the Jewish writings about what to do if your hen lays an egg on the Sabbath. What do you do? Can you eat it? Well, if you're eating it, it's something that's produced on the Sabbath. So, therefore, you're breaking the Sabbath because your hen has laid an egg on the Sabbath. So, what do you do? Well, you can only really do one thing with it. They said you sell it to a Gentile. Well, the Gentiles don't really matter. They don't really matter at all, and you get some money for it. But is that not then earning money on the Sabbath? One person said, well, you could eat the egg that was laid on the Sabbath, but only if you intend to kill the chicken on the following day, because it broke the law breaking the Sabbath. I mean, it's totally ridiculous 
But that's the, that's the logical conclusion of these things, that they go so far that they become absolutely ridiculous. And none of that's in the Scripture. None of it's in the Bible. And we, we kind of laugh about it, but we do the same thing. So often erecting fences around the gospel by adding things that are not in Scripture, that are not there, adding requirements that are nowhere to be found in the biblical record, and the harm it has done, and the people it has driven away. And we puff our chests out in pride, the most talked about sin in the New Testament, as we keep our man-made, Presbyterian-instituted, external rituals and traditions. Yep, I do that. And we look down upon and chastise and berate anyone that doesn't. But where is it in Scripture? So, Nicodemus was a rich man. He was also a Pharisee. He's part of this Pharisaical group, and they are sworn to keep the, law, the written law, but also the oral law that's been organized, been codified for them. We could say that Nicodemus was religious, down to a T. He was a Pharisee, above and beyond most people. But politically, so he's rich, he's a Pharisee, uh, politically he's a ruler, he's a, a member of the Jewish ruling council, it says. This special class of 70 uh, people known as the Sanhedrin. So, the long and short of it is Nicodemus is a big deal in Jerusalem. He's rich, he's religious, he's a ruler, he's one of the chief leaders of the nation spiritually, uh, and something else that describes him in, in verse 10 is that he was a teacher. Jesus says, you are Israel's teacher, and you don't understand these things. So, he's a, he's a ruler, he's, a, he, he, he's rich, he's, he's a Pharisee, he's religious, he, he's, a, he's a teacher, he's a rabbi, uh, you might say. He's in a special uh, class. And notice it doesn't say you are a teacher. He says you are Israel's teacher. You are the guy. You're the guy that's leading other people, and you don't understand what I'm saying uh, to you. So, history tells us that Nicodemus is one of the most sought-after, famous, uh, well-known, respected teachers of the law in Jerusalem. So, he's, he's the guy. You, know, you want to get it right religiously? Go and ask Nicodemus. You want somebody to follow, somebody to emulate? Look at Nicodemus. He is the guy. He's rich. He's, he's religious. He's a ruler. He's a rabbi. He's a teacher. So, that's his credentials as he comes to Jesus. Secondly, we see his curiosity. Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. Why did he come at night? We don't know. There's a lot of speculation about why he came at night, and was it because of secret sin, or was it because he was afraid to be seen with Jesus? Uh, was it because he wanted to do it under the cover of darkness because there was an element of clandestine uh, meeting uh, to it? There's loads of speculation. People say maybe he came out of fear, but it doesn't tell us why he came at night. It just states that he came at night. Could it be that he just came for some quality time with Jesus. The rabbis used to say that the best time to study the Torah, the law, was at night, when things were quiet, when people weren't around, when you were undistracted. Jesus, as we know, had crowds, crowds swarming around Him during the day, but at night perhaps it was quieter. Perhaps at night it gave an opportunity for Him to have a one-on-one -on -one interaction with Jesus. We can assume that Nicodemus, with his significant status as a member of the Sanhedrin, as a teacher, as a, a wealthy man, as a ruler, he would have had busy days and a busy schedule himself. So, perhaps coming at night was just better for both of them. But the important thing isn't that he came at night. The important thing is that he came. The important thing is that he came to Jesus. And, you know, we can have a go at people for all manner of things that they're coming with the wrong motivation, that they're, they're doing this or doing that. Does it matter? As long as we come to Jesus, is the motivating factor uh, worth worrying about as long as people come to Jesus? No, we're just glad that they come to Jesus. And so, he comes to Jesus and he calls him rabbi. It's a term of uh, politeness. It's a term of equality even. 
uh, as he himself is a teacher. He's saying, look, I recognize you, Jesus, as to be somebody on my level. Of course, he's wrong about that, isn't he? Because Jesus was far more than a, than a mere rabbi, and he certainly wasn't equal with Nicodemus. He was far, far greater than Nicodemus and anyone else, regardless of how significant they may be in worldly terms. But Nicodemus doesn't know that yet, so we're not going to hold that against him. He says, Rabbi, and he notice he, he uses the, the, the plural pronoun. He says, we know. We know. Who's we? Well, he's probably representing a number of the religious leaders who have seen what Jesus is doing, who perhaps have witnessed some of the teaching, have seen some of all these signs and wonders that he's been doing, that many people are coming to believe in him. Probably not the whole uh, Sanhedrin, probably not all 70, uh, but certainly him and a few others, maybe Joseph of Arimathea, sympathetic towards Jesus, the signs and the wonders that he's doing, wondering, could this be the Messiah? We know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Again, Nicodemus, eh, eh, you're wrong. Jesus was not a teacher come from God. Moses would be a teacher come from God, Jeremiah, Isaiah. Those would be teachers come from God. Jesus was far more than a teacher come from God. He was the God who had come to teach. But Nicodemus didn't know that yet. But this illustrates how a lot of people deal with Jesus. They'll recognize Him to a degree, even those that we looked at last week, recognized Him, believed in His name because of what He was doing, but fell short of really trusting Him and really knowing Him and really identifying His true identity. Jesus is a, is a good person. Yeah, he was a good person, a good teacher, a great example, able to do great things. True, all of those things are true, but He was far more than that. He was God incarnate, the Word became flesh, the Word who was in the beginning, the one who was pre-existent. And Nicodemus will be led towards that, and before the conversation's over, uh, we'll, we'll take this week and next week, God willing, to, to look at that. But what's on his mind? Why does Nicodemus come to Jesus? Well, we can say that most probably it's because he's thinking about the kingdom of God. He's a Pharisee. He's concerned with spiritual matters, and he's spiritually curious about who this man is that is doing these amazing things, that is teaching with such authority, that has come from nowhere, and yet is so significant. Jesus has been in Jerusalem all of that week, the Passover, doing signs and miracles. Everybody knew about it. He's the talk of the town. Maybe Nicodemus had heard him, seen him, heard about him. We don't know. But here we have this educated, knowledgeable, religious, cultured leader of the Jews watching, listening, and seeking a personal encounter with Jesus. He's never heard anything like this man before. He's never heard teaching like this. He's never seen anything like this. And it's, in a sense, it's drawing him in. It's this irresistible draw, this curiosity that is bringing him to Jesus. Curiosity brought him. And curiosity brings many of us, does it not, to faith. Curiosity is the thing that ignites our desire to know more. What brought you today? Routine? The, re the desire to, to worship God, I hope. But perhaps curiosity. Curiosity about who Jesus is, who God is, what He is like, and, and why He does what He does. Curiosity brings lots of people that drew Nicodemus in, spiritual curiosity. So, we see his credentials. We see this curiosity. Thirdly, we see the condition. Nicodemus comes with better credentials than most religiously, but he was curious spiritually. Why? Because for all of his religious working, for all of his religious goodness, for all of his religion, he had an emptiness. There was a yearning there was a desire for something more, something else, something. He had ticked all of the boxes, as it were. He should have been quite content, and yet there is this emptiness, as we know the God-shaped void that is in the heart, as the Lord has written His eternity into the heart of mankind. 
Spiritually, he wasn't just curious, but Jesus tells him that he's in a critical condition. There is a sense of urgency here, isn't there? I'm sure many of you have watched the, the program 24 Hours in A&E. It seems to have 8 million episodes. Every time you put the TV on, there's another episode of 24 Hours in A&E or 999 Critical Condition or Ambulance Code Red or whatever it may be. But often in these programs, what you'll find is a patient who's gravely ill or who's been involved in a serious accident, and you've got a doctor, a consultant, a specialist looking, at, uh, looking after these people, and then perhaps meeting with the family and relaying to that family or those loved ones that this patient is in a critical condition, that they are critically ill. And for Nicodemus, for all of his religious credentials and for all of his spiritual curiosity, he's gravely ill, spiritually speaking. He was putting all of his hope in the wrong things, and therefore coming up empty. He kept all the laws. In fact, he was one of the lawmakers. And yet, even in keeping all of those laws, he's unfulfilled. I wonder if you can relate to that this morning. Unfulfilled. Something. Something missing. You come to church. You do your good deeds. You read your Bible. You help people out as much as you can. You're a good person, but there's something missing. There's an area of unfulfilled desire. There's a deep longing in your soul, yearning for something more, something deeper, something that makes sense, something that will make you whole again, not to quote Atomic Kitten or anything, but something that will make us satisfied, something that will fulfill us. And that's why Jesus answers Nicodemus in the way he answers him. You'll notice in verse 3, Jesus answers Nicodemus's commendation with this, I tell you the truth. Jesus was the truth. He cuts to the chase. He cuts right through all of the stuff. He does it, oh, thanks, Nicodemus, for your words of encouragement and praise. Much, much appreciated. And he says, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Jesus wastes no time with formalities. Nicodemus comes, oh, we know that you're a teacher. We know that you couldn't do what you're doing unless God was with you. Jesus says, oh, do you like those miracles, Nicodemus? Yeah, pretty impressive, eh? Yeah, pretty good. Nobody else can do them, can they? Nobody else has seen anybody like me. Yeah, I'm different, and here's the reason why. No, he says none of those things. He says, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. It sounds like Jesus isn't even speaking in the same conversation. You know those conversations that you have with your wife if you're, if you're married, and they're talking about something, and you think, I have got absolutely no idea what you're talking about. Or maybe it's just me, because uh, my wife's mind seems to go from one subject to another, and I'm supposed to just keep up without even knowing. It's kind of like this. It's almost like Nicodemus is like, eh, what? What is that? I don't, you must be born again. I was just saying I like, enjoyed your miracles, you know, that you, you're obviously a significant guy. Jesus is saying, very truly, I tell you, you must be born again. Jesus is answering the question that Nicodemus never asked with his mouth, but was in his heart. And it makes perfect sense when you read it in the context of what we read last week, the subject matter that we had last week, because it's all in the same context. There was no chapter breaks in the original manuscript. Jesus knew the thoughts and the hearts of man. He knew what was in a man. He knew the heart. He knows what's in my heart and what's in your heart, what's in my mind and what's in your mind. So, here comes Nicodemus coming to see him, seeking a private audience with Jesus, and Jesus knows him. He knows what's in his heart. He knows the desires of his heart. He knows the thoughts of his mind. Nicodemus comes and says, oh, well, you're, you're really good. Jesus, great. And Jesus says, listen, this is what you need to know. You need to be born again. Very truly, I tell you, verily, verily, most assuredly, I say, just like grabbing him by the lapels and saying, look into my eyes and listen to what I am saying. It's of utmost importance. It was of utmost importance because Nicodemus' destiny hangs upon how he listens and what he does with this statement of Jesus. Everything else will flow from that. So, we see his credentials. We see his spiritual curiosity. We see his condition, which was critical. And then Jesus gives us the cure. He says, you must be born again. What does that exactly mean? You know, we hear about it. Oh, yeah, they've been born again. They've been reborn. We talk about it in 
you know, a footballer who's uh, regained their form, or a, a, a Tiger Woods has deconstructed his swing and redone it, and it's, it's like a born-again uh, golfer. Well, the first of all thing that we have to push aside is the negative connotations that you have over the past few generations with the term born again. Oh, you're one of those born again Christians, are you? Well, you don't get any other kind of Christian. Every believer in Jesus, every Christian follower of the Christ is a born again Christian. There is no other kind of Christian, regardless of whether you're Presbyterian, uh, Evangelical, Methodist, Lutheran, Calvinist, whatever it may be, whether you're a Baptist, an adult baptism, pedo-baptism, whatever it may be, if you're a follower of Jesus, it's a prerequisite that you are born again. You will never make it to heaven otherwise. It's absolutely essential. It's a prerequisite. We can say we're a Christian. We can say many things, but do we live as such? The world thinks, the world at large, generally speaking, says that the West is Christian. The West is no more Christian than fly in the air. Our roots were Christian, but we now live in a post-Christian society, in a post-Christian world, a world that has turned away from God. We live in the land of the judges, don't we? And we see the decay of everything in that. Think about it just for a moment. As you see the turning away from God by the societies that we live in, turning away from God, turning away from His Word, from His principles, what does that lead to? Anarchy. It leads, first of all, to the breakdown of family. And the breakdown of family then leads to the breakdown of society. And it's right before us. It's happening. It's unfolding. It's on our TV screens and on our news feeds every single day. It's undeniable. Yes, many of our institutions, many of our educational institutions and otherwise were built upon Christian foundations with Christian principles. They were built as a result of Christian faith. And as they adhered to such, they thrived and they flourished and they grew and they changed, but not so much now. Uh, The Greek here, if we're being born again, means either to be born from above or to be born a second time, born again. I think born from above is very helpful. It's picturesque in what the Christian faith is, is it that it removes the responsibility or the ability from us, that it comes from God. That's how Nicodemus took it. He says, he, he talks about being born a second time. How, how, how's this going to work? You can't go back into to the womb a second time. Why does Jesus speak to Nicodemus about second birth? Why does He use this analogy? Here's why. Because Nicodemus is a ruler of the Jews. Nicodemus the Pharisee, Nicodemus the religious Jewish guy, all, him and all of his cronies believed that the only thing necessary for entrance into the kingdom of God was their birth. Their birth. If you're Jewish, if you're a descendant of Abraham, moreover, if you kept the law with all of your heart, then you were guaranteed a place in God's kingdom. And Jesus comes along and He says, no, wrong. That's not how it works. It would have been like a a crushing blow to all of His legalism, to all of His religion, to all of His good works, to all of His religious sincerity. Jesus says, worthless, useless, not enough. You need to be born again to enter into the kingdom of heaven. All that stuff, all the ceremony and all the ritual and all the tradition and all the religion, worthless when it comes to salvation, useless when it comes to a place in in my Father's kingdom. None of these things, Nicodemus, will bring you a place in God's kingdom. None of them. You must be reborn you must be born again. You must be born from above. That's helpful because it's something that's out with our scope of ability. We cannot do it. That's the wonder of the gospel, that it is by grace that you have been saved, that God declares us righteous. doesn't make us righteous because we're not, but He declares us righteous in His sight through Christ. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That's the Christian faith. 
And he calls it new birth because it's an entrance into new life. The old is gone, the new has come, new creations in Christ. The only reason that we will live eternally is because we have been reborn, because we've had birth. To have life, we must have birth. And the reason we need a new birth is that we were all born dead, dead in our trespasses and sins, dead on arrival, as it's put, Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. But because of God's great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our sins, dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. So here's Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews, the rich rabbi, the ruler who thought that his physical birth was enough to guarantee him entrance, coupled with his religious observance, was guaranteeing it. And here comes Jesus saying, you're not even in the ballpark. You're not even in the game. You're not even close. A crushing blow to him. I wonder if it's a blow to you this morning to recognize that there's nothing that you can do to enter into God's kingdom, that it's all been done, that the cure is found in Jesus to your critical condition. Well, I'm a churchgoer. I've been a churchgoer all my life. I believe in, in God. I, I mean, I'm sincere. I'm politically conservative. I, I must be going to heaven. I'm a good guy. I'm a good gal. What does Jesus say? You must be born again. I've kept the rules, though. I've been rigid in my observation of all that is religious. Everything that my forefathers and the tradition of my people has drilled into me. I've kept all of that. What does Jesus say? You must be born again. You must be born again. How can a man be born when he's old, says Nicodemus? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? Most assuredly, verily, very, very truly, I say to you, unless you're born of water and of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, we could get bogged down here. There are so many interpretations of what we have here. There are at least six interpretations of what it means to be born of the water and of the Spirit, and we don't have time to enter into all of that today. But let me tell you what it doesn't mean. It has nothing to do with baptism. There are churches, there are denominations out there who will teach that if you are baptized, you are eternally secure. Nowhere in Scripture does it teach us that. Nowhere does it teach that we are to be baptized in order to be saved. We are to repent and then be baptized. If, if salvation is, if, is reliant upon baptism, then why didn't Jesus go around baptizing people? The Bible specifically says that Jesus baptized nobody. He'd be baptizing all over the place if it was a prerequisite for salvation. That's what he would be doing. So, what does it mean? Well, it can mean one of two things, being born of the water and of the Spirit. It could simply mean the cleansing nature of salvation, being born of the water or the use of the water and the Spirit were Old Testament descriptions about being spiritually cleansed. Ezekiel 36, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit on you uh, and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. It could be that that's the, the passage that Jesus had in mind. He's speaking to an expert in the law. Nicodemus might have thought, oh, Ezekiel, I, I know this. I know what he's saying. He would have been familiar with that. So, it could be spiritual cleansing. It, alternatively, when Jesus spoke of being born of the water and of the Spirit, He could simply have been talking about physical birth followed by spiritual birth. And that's because in ancient times, the people used to refer to anybody being born, physically born, as being born of water. You'll find some references to that in ancient literature. We know it ourselves, her waters broke. We talk about that when a woman is going to give birth and the amniotic fluid, uh, I'll not get into it, but the waters break. A baby is born of water. So, you could simply be saying, just as the the first birth was necessary for physical life, so too the second birth necessary for spiritual life. 
That would make sense out of the next verse, wouldn't it? That which is born of the flesh is flesh, born of, the water, born of water, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So, one of those two things. Fifthly, finally, very briefly, change. Jesus ends this dialogue part uh, by talking about observable change. Nicodemus has got another question. We'll get to that next time, God willing. But Jesus uses the example of the wind here. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. I think the reason that Jesus says that to Nicodemus is because Nicodemus is kind of looking at him wide-eyed, probably jaw has hit the floor. What? All of these things going through Nicodemus's mind, and he's saying, look, you shouldn't be surprised, Nicodemus, at me saying these things to you. You shouldn't be surprised at me saying you must be born again. He's saying, but all of everything I've invested in all of my life and my belief system, you're telling me is worthless? And Jesus is saying, you shouldn't be surprised by this. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it's come from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. You don't see the wind. You don't know exactly where it came from or where it's going. We cannot see it, but we can certainly feel it. We live in the West Highlands. We can certainly feel it. If you've ever lived in the Western Isles, you can definitely feel it. We used to live in the U.S., and there were days where you had to be careful going outside, even those with a good ballast like myself. You can't see it, but you could certainly feel it. You could hear it. You could hear the roar coming in off the Atlantic. You can see its power, things that vanish. If you live in the U.S., you've got to either tie it down or nail it down, or it will be gone, never to be seen again. The effects of the wind is evident. Jesus says, you know, Nicodemus, there are some things that are real and you just cannot see them. And just because you cannot see them doesn't mean that they're not real. They are real. So it is with physical birth and with spiritual birth can't see it. What you should know is that there's a play on word in the Greek uh, here. The word for wind and the ver- word for uh, spirit are the same word. The word for wind and the word for spirit, and it's the word pneuma, as in pneumatic, P-N-E-U-M-A. We, we get words like pneumatic drill or uh, pneumatic tools, pneumatic tires, all of these things. It means air, breath, wind, spirit. It's a play on words. So, the pneuma operates like the pneuma. The Spirit operates like the wind. It's powerful. It's unseen. You cannot see it, but you can see the activity of it. You can see the change that it brings. You can see what it does. That's the point, isn't it? That when a person has been born again, we are changed. What we do is changed. That we are different renewed people. We see the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians. You shouldn't be surprised at my saying, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Notice the word there. He doesn't say, don't marvel that I say to you that you should be born again. He says, you must, must, not should, not might want to think about, might not want to try, you must be born again if you want to see my Father's kingdom. He's not leaving much wiggle room, is he? It's pretty exclusive, an exclusive claim. He doesn't say, you know, Nicodemus, it's always been my opinion that one of the many options that that, that will take you on the road to kind of where you want to be, uh, you just have to choose the road that kind of suits you best, and well, eventually you'll be born again. No, he doesn't say that. He says you must be born again. George Whitfield, the the preacher, always used to preach on this text, and somebody once said to him, why do you always preach on the new birth and being born again? And Whitfield replied, because Jesus said, you must be born again. It's a must. Who's he saying this to? Who's Jesus saying this to here? To an unbeliever? To a pagan? To a garden variety uh, believer? To a, a, a nominal religious man? No, he's saying it to Nicodemus. He's saying it to the most religious man in the the city, the one who thought his religion would save him, who believed that good works would save him, who believed that his status in the world and in the church would save him. And Jesus says, you must be born again. You must 
be born again. Are you born again? You may have the religious credentials better than anyone. You may have come here, you may know the Bible, you may observe the laws, you may do the right stuff, walk the walk, do the do. But are you born again? Have you met with Jesus? Has He made you new? If so, is it evident? If not, ask Him, and He'll surely oblige. Let's pray. Our Lord and God, we thank You for the gospel. We thank You for its invitation and for its challenge, the way it challenges the preconceptions that we have, the expectations that we may amass in our own minds. We thank You, Lord God, that it shatters these things and shows us Jesus. May each and every one come to You and know new birth and new life and new hope and eternal security in and through Jesus, the life giver, we ask in His name. Amen. Of course, we're going to sing uh, from the hymn, Jehovah Said Can You, um, which means the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah Said Can You is the Lord our righteousness. We are not righteous, but He is and gives it uh, to us. I'm hoping that the accompaniment will play in the video. If not, you have the words, let's stand and sing uh, to God's praise. I once was a stranger to grace and to God. I knew my, not my danger and felt not my load. We'll stand and we'll sing. I once was a stranger to grace and to God. I knew not my danger and felt not my load. Though friends spoke in rapture of Christ on the tree, Jehovah said, Can you? Was nothing to me. Like tears from the daughters of Zion that woe, I wept when the waters went over his soul, yet thought not that my sins had nailed to the tree. Jehovah said, Can you? T'was nothing to me. When free grace awoke me by light from on high, then legal fear shook me. I trembled to die. No refuge, no safety. Self could I see? Jehovah said, Can you, my Saviour, must be? My terrors all vanished before the sweet name. My guilty fears banished with boldness I came. To drink at the fountain, life giving and free. Jehovah said, Can you? Is all things to me? Jehovah said, Can you? My treasure and boast. Jehovah said, Can you?
now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, love of God, and fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and remain with us all now and evermore. And all God's people say, Amen. Thank you.